really appreciate the discussion of roles and uh, all that. I just wondered if you could speak for a moment to the importance of uh, family worship and how it fits into the context of uh, roles and uh, dedication to each other within the home. There are many homes that do observe family worship and have a time of family worship, and there are many homes that don't. In and of itself, it's not a, it's not a specific guarantee of the salvation of all who are in the home. Any time that we spend in service to God is valuable time and is time well spent and it teaches the value of setting aside time that could be used for something else in honor of God. So it's easier when children are young. It's much easier when children are young. It's much harder when everybody goes separate ways if you have a large family. So there can be a time that you have to steal for the Lord. And I don't care if it's early or late. I don't care if it's everybody eats breakfast together. Therefore, you have at least a scripture that you talk about or that you have time in prayer. I don't care if it's everybody has separate bedtime, so you have separate prayer times with each of the children when that happens. But you have to figure out how that's going to work for your family because I've never yet seen one size fit all for any family in observing a family worship. But anything done in that area is invaluable and will never be forgotten. It's wonderful to do. Greg, you did a great job. Thank you. You really did. Would you address the issue of mothers working outside the home? Because that's when, my, that's when, when I was growing up, that's when my family fell apart me and my sisters would come home to an empty house and uh, with no supervision there, we took care of ourselves physically, but now we got into, I, my sisters didn't get as much trouble as I did. Mm -hmm. Probably deservedly so, but that's. <laughs> and, well, tr uh, trouble that my parents never knew about. Oh, I see, I see, yeah. And I'm very concerned because I feel like when, uh, when mothers and fathers decide, you know, both parents need to be working, mm -hmm. we have to work. Mm -hmm. I wonder sometimes how necessary is this for the mother to be working outside the home? Mm -hmm. Is it how, you know, how good of a choice are we making? How really essential is this? And how, how is it affecting our families? I think it's hurting us. And um, I'd like you to comment on that. And I'd also like you to comment on the concept of a family altar and the need to every day as a family sit down together and have family worship. Mm -hmm. Because uh, with my family growing up, uh, our oldest one, we were inexperienced when the first child came along, and we were rebuked because she wasn't, Jody wasn't behaving the way she should. So we, we started playing church at mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. And for 30 minutes every evening, we all sat down on the couch together, and we read the Bible together, and Jody had to learn how to sit quiet and mm -hmm. be still for 30 minutes every night mm -hmm. and she learned how to be still and quiet in church yeah and uh, I'd like you to comment on the mothers working out of the home in the family mm -hmm. altar if you would so um, a godly mother is wonderful anywhere and everywhere and if the godly mother is able to be at home with her children her children will benefit greatly from that for the rest of their lives. Proverbs 31 talks to us about the virtuous woman. Cassie loves it when I preach on that, and she usually points out, where's the woman? Well, she's out there looking at a crop, looking at her, her workers, organizing the manufacturing and the sale of these garments. Where's her husband? He's sitting at the gate. 
and it's like, works for me. I think that's a pretty good arrangement. So the virtuous woman never, ever forsook or neglected her family. So if you look there for what the virtuous woman did, it was all about her family, even as she made money for the family. So I do believe that with careful thought and consideration, this can be done. Now, is it possible in every young family's life for the woman to not participate in, in income production? That's not possible these days. Is it preferred? Of course. But it's not possible everywhere. Therefore, when the job is selected, it needs to be a job that allows the family to be given a priority. Now, we can do this. We can do this just fine. So it may mean that as your babies grow up a little bit, that you have a daycare in your home. That means that the mom can do her best to take care of the children, and she may take care of somebody else's children a time or two. And I know this can work because we did it. And so we got to see other children's first steps and new teeth and lost teeth, but we had our kids at our home with Cassie. So we figured out how to make that work. As our kids got older and were in school and that continued, the daycare went away and then Cassie got a job at the school working in the cafeteria. What that meant was she had the exact same schedule as our kids. When they were out of school, she was out of school. When they went to school, she went to school. When she came home, they came home. And yes, she did provide help with income in our family, but our children were an absolute priority. So the question to ask is, how are the children a priority in our families? And a lot of times we forget that. We just forget that. And we think it's demeaning if we do something like have a daycare or work in a daycare or work in a cafeteria. But understand, anything that honors God in our families is not demeaning. I don't care as long as it's not immoral and wrong to do. It's a wonderful thing for us to do. So we can do this. We can work this out. And the people where our people work will be so amazed at the values that our people bring to their workplace. And they may be told, yeah, I'm here because your schedule fits my kid's schedule. And if my kid's schedules change, guess what? I'll be gone. Because <laughs> I am going to have my kid's schedule. Now, so that's, that's one area. I don't think we can just blanketly say women in the church today should never ever work anything at all. Now, there are a lot of jobs that can be done at home. Those are advertised all over the nation, except in California. The laws are too weird. Uh, but there's a lot of states where people can work from home. What does that mean? It means you can work early, you can work late, uh, you can work after you drop the kids off for school and still help produce income. All of that's possible. We just have to be better at figuring it out. Now, the family altar, um, that is absolutely invaluable and it is something that all should want to do after the pattern of the Old Testament teaching of children, which was continual and constant. The parents in Old Testament times were to talk to their children when they got up in the morning, when they went to bed at night, and all during the day. There was never a time when teaching wasn't done. Now, when we have such conflicting schedules that we never see each other in our families, then it's very difficult. But many times, if daddy has to work late, mama can say, let's read the Bible and let's pray. You can still have that time even if all can't be together. It is ideal. 
If there is a time every night that is a sacred time when we gather together and we read the scriptures and we talk about our day and we have a time in prayer and then we go to bed, that doesn't always end up practical. And it doesn't mean when it doesn't end up practical that you just throw it all out and forget it. It means you say, how are we going to make this work? How can we make this work the best we can? What's the concept here? The concept is to have a daily reminder of who God wants us to be. That's the concept. And to make God a priority in our lives. So with one child, it may be early in the morning. With another, it may be late at night. With another, it may be the middle of the day. So whatever that looks like in anyone's home, it's still invaluable and wonderful to do. But sometimes it's not practical to have everybody together at the same time with busy lives as, as teenagers uh, get involved in various things. I was hoping I'd talk long enough to where Ron would cut you off. But I know. Go ahead. <laughs> I knew exactly what you're doing. I've done it many times. <laughs> that was an excellent talk, Greg. Thank you. And uh, I want to address two things. First, I want to go way back to the beginning of your talk. Yeah. You know, Bobby made me talk about this stuff at the Shreveport study against my better judgment. But it went pretty well, and I've had a ton of questions since then from people. I, I don't know how all that works, but it has, and a lot of good conversations. And I think this material needs to be talked about, all that you talked about. The quote-unquote gay Christian movement mm -hmm has said for 25 or 30 years that 10% of the people in this country are LGBTQ people. Mm -hmm. That is not true. Mm -hmm. And we need to recognize that on the one hand, actually it's less than 3% across the board. However, when you said this will be at your school soon, that is true mm -hmm. because the number of young people less than 25 who are confused about these things is more like eight and a half percent. Mm -hmm. And it is increasing and has increased every year since 2012. Yeah. That is something we need to address clearly and openly and frankly with our young people about how to deal with these people because they're gonna run into them. And uh, how to be Christian when you're around them and maintain the standards that we believe in. Mm -hmm. But anyway, just that comment. Um, but I had a question there's something that's been a concern to me for a number of years, and I seem to be seeing this a lot more. Um, the wife make, both the husband and the wife work. The wife makes or is able to make more money than the husband, and so the husband stays home. Mm -hmm. And this is an effort to provide parenting for the children, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But it looks to me like this is a role reversal that's not intended in Scripture. And when the Bible says a man should provide for his own, meaning not only his own house but even his extended family, it looks like that's one of the responsibilities of men. And I think there's a lot of young men who are struggling to figure out what they want to do with their lives, and they end up unable to do much because they can't find whatever it is that would make them happy and their mm -hmm. wives are working two jobs and having babies and all mm -hmm. of that at the mm -hmm. same time. Do you have some comments about that? So, um, now this is going to sound really old fashioned. Uh, Brother Benny didn't wash the dishes. Now you may not like that example, but let me ask you this. How do you maintain a role distinction in your home? Because a lot of this, that, that's what this is all about. The blurring of male and female is about taking away role distinctions. There are role distinctions in the scriptures. And we have to figure out in our day what that looks like. Now, 
if there are children at home, they need an understanding of what daddy does and what mama does. If daddy does all of the stuff that mamas do everywhere else, that's confusing our children, confusing them horribly. Now, can a man help around the house with things? Yes. Can he sit at home and be a house husband? No, because he's not providing for his own. And he's a leech. That's all in the world he is, and a lazy leech at that. Now, he may say, but I'm taking care of the kids. That is not the man's part unless he is disabled. Now, when we get disabled and things happen, that is an exception to the normal roles that we have in our home. And we do have instances like that where people are doing the best they can with the situation they have. And yes, it may mean that the man stays home due to a disability. But when an able-bodied man is too proud to get out and do an humble job, that's just wrong and it's sinful and church leaders need to identify it and do something about it. And I do know congregations where leaders have taken men aside and said, look here, fella, you need to go do something. You need to get a job because it just looks like you're living off of your wife who has a wonderful job. And I think that is good advice. So, Whenever we switch roles, there's consequences. We confuse our kids. Our kids learn what a man is all about by what he does and by how he treats the mom. And our kids learn what a woman is all about in a Christian home by what she does and by how she treats the man in the home. Our kids go to school on us first. If they do not see a role distinction they will just do and accept about anything when they get of age. And it really confuses brand new marriages when they don't have a clue about a role distinction and they haven't been taught that in their past. So that's, there's a lot more to that soapbox, but I'll get off of that. Greg, I really appreciate all the points that you've brought out and dealt with. I had just kind of a follow-up on one of the issues in the answer about it kind of being almost impossible for one person to work yeah. and sustain the household. And I, I just would just want to get a little more feedback on that because I think sometimes the society, the culture, and our own minds, we think we have to have so many things in this life that when we realize we don't need them after we've acquired them maybe on credit or whatever, it's a financial situation that we create sometimes in, uh, that requires or that c can cause or lead to the shortage in situations that we have yeah. of resources. So I'll uh, go back to this. Ron Blue, Larry Burkett, Dave Ramsey, money guys. The Bible's full of scriptures about money. There's lots of scriptures about money. Uh, resources are available. What Dave Ramsey says, if you listen to him for five minutes, he has the same speech. He's the number three talk radio host in the nation. He has the same speech every day. What he says is don't borrow money. Don't buy something if you can't afford it. Now, I just saved you having to tune in, but go ahead and tune in. You need to hear it. <laughs> but the idea is exactly what Brother Art is saying, because we have to have. We're in a land where we have to have at any cost. And it's horrible that the borrower is servant to the lender. We can fix this. There are resources, and we can do it. First, I want to say I really enjoyed your lesson. Very good job as I always enjoy listening to you. Thank you. You did an exceptional job tonight. I like what you said about what it said about Nabal being curly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the same way. It's, I never knew what it was, but as, for as long as I can remember, I knew it was a bad thing. Yes. <laughs> but I want to go back. We've kind of been bouncing around it and something George was asking and everything we've been discussing. And, like, as far as what um, when we have – when couples have children and the jobs the wife does and – of course, I don't have very far experience on this, but it, 
I think when we talk about these things, we need to recognize, like you mentioned in Proverbs 31, there's ways that the, a mother can, jobs a mother can do, and we need to, we need we're not like it's not a blanket statement, or like there's no blanket rule, women cannot work, or things like that, and I think that's important. We need to remember Titus 2. It is in the Bible, and it's not something in a discussion like this that needs to be brought in. As in keepers at and, home. Yes, mm -hmm. and it does mean something. We may mm -hmm. not, but it, and the, um, like to make a statement we can't do it, I think we need to be careful about that because a lot of couples, if I can't eat out three times a week and go on a vacation twice a year, then I need to make more money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times spending is more of the issue than, yeah. and I know, Living here in Oklahoma, we have it pretty good. A lot of the other parts of the country are worse. But, but it, that's, I think, things that we need to keep in mind. And the, the value of a mother to her family and to her children and to the marriage, having time there may be worth a lot more than whatever money can get. Yeah. Um, so I know there's other people waiting, so I'll stop at that. I think those, are, those words are well said. And um, we don't know what influence we have on our kids but here's what we can know. Those early formative years, they just need to have parent time as much as possible. So I'll, give you, I'll go one step further. We've only talked about the ladies. Gentlemen, when you have young kids and you play golf, what are you doing? You may be the greatest golfer in the world but you're spending huge chunks of time away from your family. Now, I happen to not be a good golfer, so this is real easy for me to say. <laughs> when you have young kids, get rid of your golf clubs. I don't mean put them in a corner. I mean get rid of them. I don't care if they're the greatest that have ever been. Get rid of them. You have no business taking those huge chunks of time away from your family. No business at all. Well, it's important to my job. Sorry. Sorry. If your boss has to play golf with you all day Saturday in order for you to have a job on Monday, find another job. Because the time you will spend with your kids, fishing, playing in the dirt, I don't care. That's invaluable. Now, if your kids are of age to go play golf with you, go play golf. But remember that patient thing? Okay. Together is what counts for both father and mother and children. And our families that spend time together help those values, those godly values, just be part of who their children are. An absentee father is as bad and in many cases worse than an absentee mother. Both are essential, essential in the Christian home wherever possible. When there are extenuating circumstances, then whoever is there, the man or the woman, they do the best they can with the situation they're given. And may the Lord bless them with that. But don't be in a two-parent home and rob your children and your spouse of your presence for such a fleeting thing as a game of golf. Please don't do that. along with the others, I really enjoyed it. And this might sound a, a little far-fetched, but with the woman, of course, being ahead at the home as far as, you know, her duties there, what would your thoughts on, what would your thoughts be on if a uh, family decided to get like a maid or a, a cleaning lady or something along those lines? Would that be, you know, borderline dangerous? Boy, that's... <clears throat> <clears throat> so, Cassie had a time when she cleaned houses for a living. After daycare, before school, before the school job started, she cleaned houses with some other sisters in the church, which, by the way, is another wonderful way to have your kids schedule. Now, but she did complain a little bit that our house was hard to clean when she had cleaned other people's houses all day. I gently, I thought, made the suggestion that if she'd just take on a few more houses with her partners to clean, she could afford to hire somebody to clean ours. That didn't go over too well. So, in our day and age, 
we are not accustomed to domestic help. Nearly every century has had a common practice of individuals having helpers in their homes for various tasks, just like you would have helpers on the farm, etc. And so most cultures through the generations of time and centuries of time have had things like that. That doesn't diminish the role of the woman's primary focus being her home, nor does it keep her from doing work in her home, even if she has somebody come in and help once in a while. There's lots of ladies that have somebody come in and do deep cleaning or windows or something like that on a seasonal basis or an occasional basis. That does not mean that they let the dishes go till that person comes in. Uh, they still have plenty of work to do. So I, I have no issue whatsoever with an appropriateness of sharing that load if the family has the means to do so. Now, what I learned in growing up, my sister and I were the only kids. We were the help. And I think our allowance was a quarter a week. Um, so I do think kids can be taught the value of work. And if we're hiring domestic help while our kids are playing video games, I think we may need to rethink that. I think we need to say, here's a list of chores. Did you know that kids can have chores as early as the age of two and they can do very well with that? And there will be some parents here that will tell you, yeah, my four-year-old puts dirty dishes in the dishwasher. They may not do it very well, but they learn their chores. It can be learned at such an early age. And it teaches the value of work. And it teaches a way to find fulfillment in life as a person. And we all need that. Thank you, brethren, for the topic, and thank you, Greg, for such, doing such a good job. So I appreciate Brother Ethan bringing up Titus too, and I, and and so I was just I was going to ask a question along along that line. First off, also I was thinking of I have to just share with you back up in Missouri in the Ozarks where we're where I'm from. Um, some of the men up there, you know, uh, that tend to stay at the coffee shop like a long time and stuff. They're called go-getters because they take her to work in the morning and they go get her when she's done working. So, just in case you weren't familiar with that definition. But, but my question about Titus 2 and, and practicality, and I had a conversation with a sister in Christ here during this meeting, and uh, I expressed to her, you know, the, the last several years of my life, I haven't been around her and her husband, and, but early on in my life, I... I, I did, and I was around them, and, and I just wanted to thank her for her example and his example. And, you know, I, I have great parents, and, uh, and I love them, and they've done, they've done a wonderful job, and they had four children on the church and all these kinds of things. But Titus 2 seems to, to show all of us that whether they're our children or not, when we have an opportunity, practically, to set a good example and to take somebody aside and, you know, re reward requires sacrifice. And we take that person aside and, and we just know that they need somebody to help them and, and they need to maybe be talked to. And I think about people like Norman and Mary Langford when Cassandra and, Cassandra and I will be celebrating 22 years of Wooded Bliss and next Friday, this Friday. And I remember Norman and Mary taking us aside and, and showing us things out of Titus 2 and taking the time. And, you know, I, if I'd had the money, I mean, I, I didn't have any money, but, I mean, they wouldn't have took it. Mm -hmm. And I, it's invaluable. Mm -hmm. and, I, and now working with this congregation that we are working with and have the ability, and, and she's with me, my wife, to help. Practically, brother, you know, how do we help to encourage the older women and the older men encourage them please you know don't bolt for the door not that they do you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but don't bolt for the door when the church service is over and 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 check and help and try, help these young couples and help, bring, bring them over open your home like the cutters have done so mm -hmm, far mm -hmm. i mean how do we practically how, to show that this is such reward Eternally. A commitment to the Lord's church encompasses all of those things. If my commitment 
is to my softball team. You're going to know it. That's where I'll be. That's what I'll talk about. That's what I spend my money on. That's my focus. That's my passion. If our commitment is to the Lord's church, it should be as obvious. As our roles change with the passing of years, we go from those who have benefited from the advice of others to those who see opportunities to give advice if we have earned the right to do so. Now, for somebody that gets here late, dashes out the door as soon as it's over, but pauses on this day to come up and complain about the songs that were led or the prayer that was led or the sermon that was led, that doesn't go very far with me. But when someone who makes the church their life says, I have some suggestions that I think you need to hear, let's talk. Let's talk. Now, as we then have an influence, we'll have opportunities to share and to help. If we are to have an influence in our congregations or in the community of congregations, it will be because we are known and we are trusted as faithful Christians. That takes time and that takes consistency and that takes commitment. You mentioned the Langfords. Their roots go back a long ways in the community where you are. And their reputation for faithfulness is known and well-deserved. And so it wasn't like somebody who wasn't there the last four Sundays wanted to talk to you about your sermon today. It was somebody that you loved and that loved you. And if we're not committed to the Lord's church, how are we the family of God? How do, how do we act as the bride of Christ if we're not committed to the Lord's church? So every congregation usually ends up with a core group that you can count on. And those are the people that you can go to. And where there's an eldership, they practice this. They go to the people in the congregation that have stood the test of time and are gentle and wise. And they've said, would you please go talk to this young family? Would you please go talk to them? Or they may do it themselves. And when they go, they will know that they're going out of love and they should be received in the spirit of love as well, knowing that everybody has only their best interests at heart. But it takes this commitment. And so we ask ourselves, do we have advice to give? Oh, my. <laughs> everybody has advice to give. Have we paid our dues to give that advice? Have we associated with anybody? Have we had anybody in our home? Have, have we gotten together as a group do we know what's going on in people's lives at all? Do we know where our kids are at in school? Do we know what topics they struggle with? Do we know what's going on in their dating life? Do we know what's happening with this young family with a new colicky baby? Do we know these things? We do, and it doesn't mean that we're nosy. It just means we're the family of God. And when we're the family of God is when the Lankfords take aside a young man and say, we've noticed some things, can we talk? And that's a beautiful part, I think, of God's, of God's redemptive quality. So we look at um, Priscilla and Aquila. What they do with Apollos? They were willing. I don't know how well they knew him, but they were willing to gently get acquainted and help. How well did they know Paul? I don't know. But they were willing to say, yeah, come make tents with us. And so you have such beautiful examples in Bible, in Bible characters of those very things.